All right, I'm going to be gone again, so we're back to kind of distance learning. Only the professor is the one who's at a distance, and you're actually on campus. This particular module, module 11, is going to deal with transport services, or the transport layer, which we talked about ad nauseum way back in the first couple of weeks. This is the layer that really does the work of trying to deliver data from one process to another. And so its job is to know what application is sending the data and what application should be receiving the data. Let's try to get my mouse up here. And we call this logical communication because at this layer, it doesn't really worry about the hosts, what, what is the host number. It just sort of assumes that there's a process, a, a layer below it, that will deal with delivering it to the remote host. And its job is really to multiplex. In other words, there'll be multiple streams coming into this layer from the IP layer from below. And its job will be, there might be 15 or 20 applications. And its job will be to take that one stream coming up from the IP layer and use port numbers to figure out which of the many applications should get the data. It only runs in the end systems. This is different from what we see in IP. In IP, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this here. Hopefully it'll work. I get down here to where I can get a marker up because this is so much fun. In IP, you have all the systems, and IP is aware of all of them. So from the source to the destination, you got all of them. But at the transport layer, you're really only concerned about the source and the destination. And in their mind, they're talking to each other. Now, now they know that the, that the actual data is coming through the transport layer, but they don't care. Uh, because I'm going to take these two end systems now, and they have multiple programs that they're communicating with. And so their job is to take the data from one program and deliver it to another. Okay, let's see. So that's why at this layer we have the port function. I've said several times, and it's important for you to keep in mind that every layer has some field, some part of the protocol that identifies what the layer above it is uh, what part of the layer above it is going to be used. So at the Ethernet layer, we've got the type field, and the type field tells the Ethernet layer at layer two what layer three protocol, IP, uh, ARP, you know, any one of them, routing protocols. That type field says, hey, this is the guy above you to deliver this to. The same thing happens in the IP layer. It has a protocol field to tell it whether it's a TCP packet or a UDP packet. So the layer three knows when he's delivering the data to layer four where to go. Same thing happens here. We've got a port number. The port number is really a pointer to a process or a pointer to an application. And so that's how TCP knows what process or what application to deliver uh, it from. And so we kind of talked about this other point. How is it different? IP layer provides host identification, but at this layer, the transport layer provides application identification. All right. So we've got this idea of multiplexing. It's a process of feeding multiple streams into a single stream. I will pretend that this is a good drawing. You can pretend along with me. And we have a stream of data. I'm going to see if I can get crazy with the colors here. Can black up. Here's another stream. And one more. We'll get dark blue up and here is another stream and so this stream comes up and goes to the blue application and the black one comes up here and goes to the black application and the red one comes up here and goes to the red application let's make that one a triangle and so we have a, a single stream coming in and that gets that's a multiple of data streams but it looks like a single stream coming from the IP layer down here when it gets to the TCP layer or the UDP layer, and those are awful, uh, it then demultiplexes. It takes multiple streams and turns them into single streams. It demultiplexes. So now that we know this, 
we come down here to this bottom bullet, which is kind of interesting. And this is a foundation of a really key concept in data communications. How can you identify a conversation? Well, if you know the two IP addresses, then you know the two hosts that are talking. If you know the port numbers, then you can identify the processes or applications on those hosts. And the last thing then that you need is the protocol because you can have the same port number in both UDP and IP, I'm sorry, UDP and TCP. So you must know whether it's UDP or TCP. And if you know these five things, you can identify a conversation. Now, routers today use give engineers the ability to identify many, many other things in what we call a flow. This, this is the beginning of identifying what we call a flow, a flow of data between two unique endpoints. And so um, this is kind of a really interesting thing to keep in mind then, that within the layer three and layer four uh, bits of information, we can actually identify a specific flow. All right, so with that in mind, let's look at UDP, which is, um, I think it's called user datagram protocol, but I call it the unreliable datagram protocol because it is officially unreliable. It makes no guarantees. It is a no frills, low overhead. Uh, as we see here in just a second, it has it is an eight byte header that's and it has four fields. So because of that, there's less overhead, there's less processing overhead, and it is extremely quick. But if you lose packets, you get no recovery. UDP makes no effort to track. Uh, did this arrive? And so this is an example. Many people think the transport layer has a job of guaranteeing delivery of data, but that's not true. The transport layer can be either UDP or TCP or even some other protocols, and UDP specifically makes no guarantees. So it's low overhead, it's stateless. Uh, if you drop, if you're a UDP process and you are asked by a, an application to send data, you will package it up, drop it to the IP layer and forget it. You will not track it, you will not think about it, you won't worry about it if it got delivered or anything. And it's also connectionless. You can send UDP data to some other system. And even if you haven't asked, hey, can we talk? You can just send it. And likewise, you could just say, hey, I'm going to listen for UDP data on port 50,000. And other people could just start sending it. They wouldn't have to ask you permission. They could just send it without saying, hey, let's work out the details. So why would you ever use it? It's unreliable. It doesn't guarantee anything. It you can't set it up. It doesn't do error recovery. Well, it turns out that there are a number of protocols or a number of applications that benefit from a very high speed, low overhead protocol. And they actually even don't mind if you drop a packet or two. One of the best ones is voice over IP. You will you will be getting 8,000 samples per second and compressing those into some smaller number of actual bits and bytes. But if you lose a sample or two, it's not that big a deal because the user who's hearing voice over IP and the speaker who is speaking into a voice over IP system, if they lose a tiny bit of data, their brains will fill in the, the part that was missing. See, I left the M out there. You figured out that I said missing instead of what it, I actually said missing. If I had dropped a, a bunch of packets that made up the M in the word missing and you heard issing, in the middle of a sentence of, is there data issing, you would say, what did he say? I think he said missing, and you would plug that in. And it, even as, I think I said this earlier in the semester, even if you, or if UDP caught the error and said, oh, we dropped these packets that made the mmm sound, and then delivered it, a little later you'd have this data that was issing, mmm, and that wouldn't make any difference anyway. So there are some applications where if you drop data, you're just like, I gotta go on. It doesn't help me to go back and recover that data. There are other applications that are that are very transactional, very simple. And if you if they fail because there are only like two or three packets being transmitted, you'll simply try them again. And that that DNS domain name systems and simple network protocol, network management protocol, SNMP, these are those kinds of systems. So if you have a lightweight application that cannot really make good use of retransmitted data or um, is very real time, then UDP is a good one. Video used to always be UDP, but I've watched over the last few years, YouTube has actually gone to TCP. It's been a little bit of a surprise to me, but it has. All right, so here is your packet format for 
the user datagram protocol, you have a source port number, a destination port number. These are 16 bits. So they can be numbers from really 1 down to 65,000. But there are some that are reserved. Really, anything under 10,000 is a pretty good chance that it has been reserved by some program. And the people who made that program went and asked the um, Internet Engineering Task Force, the EITF, hey, can we reserve this? And many of these ports are very, very well known. And um, so like FTP or Telnet or you guys will have used uh, HTTP all the time. That uses port 80, things like that. But here's a bunch of them and just give you some examples. The, in addition, you will get the length. Now this length includes the header. So since this is 16 bits, the maximum size that it can make is 65,000. 535 but there are 8 bits in the header so we take those 8 bits out and we're left with 65,527 is the maximum size of a UDP data portion so the data portion can only have 65,527 and by the way this length field uh, will also be this will also be impacted if there's an IP header and things like that on there so keep in mind this length is for the whole thing and then this checksum is um, it's a really weird checksum. It is a um, they, UDP assumes that it's going to be run over IP. It makes a kind of a fake IP address, and then it includes that or not IP address, a fake IP header. I don't know. You can't read that. Um, and then it says, "Hey, um, I'm going to make a checksum up over all these fields," and then it plugs it in there. It's a once complement checksum, just exactly like. The IP only it uses different fields to calculate it. All right, and so that is your UDP protocol. Very, very straightforward. And um, again, it's very important here to understand that this is unreliable. UDP makes no guarantees. It doesn't try to fix anything. It doesn't do acts, acknowledgments, negative acknowledgments. It makes no timers. Remember the Byzantine General's problem. That thing was guaranteed. And so the general wanted to try to make sure that the message had been delivered. Well, UDP sort of recognizes the message is never going to be delivered with 100% guarantee, but we'll just go with it. All right. So that is the end of UDP on this particular lecture.